Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. It's your boy Prophet coming with another presentation. Now, this presentation is relevant because it speaks on two fronts, okay? One front is the age ending debate whether or not the law is done away with, whether the law is still in effect. And the other one is a special treat that I thought uh, really hit close to home especially with me because um, I didn't really look at it. Um, I didn't look at it um, the way that it was, in, well, I don't know how it was intended, you know? Um, I looked at it as a lesson to get more understanding of Paul and his writings get more understanding in regards to if the law is done away with or not. <clears throat> but I ended up uh, having a lot of self-reflection. And since I had a lot of self-reflection, I figured sharing this, it could affect someone else and help someone else along their walk. So um, we're going to get right into it. Uh, forgive me, I'm a little under the weather, but we're going to push through. Because all glory goes to the most high. Alright, so. <clears throat> majority of this lesson is going to be in Romans chapter 7. But we are going to, for the sake of those watching who may believe that the law has been done away with. Or maybe um, new to the scriptures. We're going to just go through everything that uh, the lesson has. So we're going to start, oh, excuse me, we're going to start in the book of Isaiah. <coughs> we're going to start in the book of Isaiah. All right, so we're going to go to Isaiah. We're going to go to Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28, nine, uh, verse 9 through 13. All right, so, <clears throat> and the reason we're going here is to get some clarification. Now, like I said, we're going to be in the, the chapter, um, chapter seven of Romans, and we're going to be going throughout the chapter. And some people who are not familiar with the precept or who are not familiar with this scripture that we're about to get into right now may wonder why we are going to go through the, 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 the chapter of Romans the way we are, all right? Because it's not going to be read verse 1, read verse 2, read verse 3, read verse 4. We're going to bounce around. And the reason for that is because the Most High gives us instruction on how to understand His Word. So in Isaiah 28 and verse 9, it reads, <clears throat> Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak for this people unto this people. To whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not lit they were not here. But the word of the most high was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken, and snared and taken. All right. So, <clears throat> as we clearly read here in verse 9, it says, To whom shall I teach knowledge and to make understand doctrine? Doctrine is scripture. Doctrine is um, a way and instruction. It is, what it, it is what it is. We might, when we hear doctrine, we get weary. Okay, we, we hear doctrine and we, we automatically get defensive. 
when we automatically get skeptical because there's so many false doctrines out there okay and doctrine is used really use is, is used really loosely when somebody reads the scriptures get their own interpretation they come up with their doctrine but that's not that's not what this is what it, what the scriptures is referring to is the truth all right so it says precept must be upon precept now for this purpose for the purpose of this video okay i'll clarify a precept is not just two or more verses that go together a precept is an instruction from the most high okay it's an instruction or an or a command that is reinforced by another instruction or command that's, and that's for clarification now i'll also in this video in the description put a link to a video i did going in a thorough breakdown of what a precept actually is all right so but it also says that line must be upon line here a little and there a little and that is the portion of what we're going to get into in the, in the um, chapter of romans today all right so now that we got that out the way you understand that you, you you're not gonna get an understanding of true doctrine by just reading it like a book you can read the bible cover to cover and you can get stories you can understand the the concepts and different things like that but you won't get a full understanding of the scriptures because the scriptures weren't written in in that way to be understood the most high put secrets the most high put hidden messages and the most high he did it in a way that you have to bounce around in order to get the full understanding, the full picture. All right. So next, <clears throat> let's quickly go to Revelations 14 and 12. Okay. Revelations 14 and 12. And it reads, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of Ahiah, to the Most High, or Elohim, and the faith of the Messiah, or Yasha, or whatever you call Messiah. Okay. <clears throat> it says, here's the patience of the saints, them that keep the commandments. Now, one may say, oh yeah, the commandments, the Ten Commandments, cool. But... Any command from the Most High, any instruction from the Most High, any law given from the Most High is a commandment. Don't confuse the Torah, the 613 laws, and the Ten Commandments as separate. All of it encompasses one total law, the commandments of the Most High. All right. <clears throat> so now that we got that. If you haven't guessed it by now, I am a firm believer that the laws of the Most High have not been done away with. We're gonna, we're gonna get into it. We're gonna get into Paul's writings and really get an understanding on what he's saying in some of them. All right. <clears throat> All right. So. We're in Romans chapter 7 now. Go to Romans chapter 7. We're going to start with verse 6. Verse 6 of Romans chapter 7. And it reads, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Now when you read that, reading it at face value, you would say, oh, yeah, see, we don't have to follow the law no more. We're delivered. You read it right there in the scriptures. It's right there. It's right there. You can't tell me that we have to follow the law because right here, Paul said, we're delivered from it. Now, notice that we went to Isaiah for a reason because you cannot read one verse completely out of context and think you have understanding. And also, I say this all the time. You cannot understand the New Testament without having a firm foundation and understanding of the Old Testament because the New Testament just basically regurgitates 
what is in the Old Testament. Paul, the Messiah, the apostles, the disciples, they all spoke from the Old Testament. They didn't come up with their own thoughts. They didn't come up with some new doctrine, some new philosophy. They all followed the law of the Old Testament, the Torah, the law of Moses that was given to him from the Most High. Okay. Now, and I know that scripture cannot contradict itself. It cannot. What scripture says here, it has to say here. And they have to line up. If they don't, then that makes the Most High a liar. That makes the scriptures false. That makes everything null and void. So, with an understanding that the scriptures cannot contradict themselves, and understanding that Paul cannot be made a liar, okay, I have to go on that precedent. Now, in the book of Acts, and I, I did this in another video. Uh, uh, the video broke down the um, whole book of, well, not the whole book of Acts, but uh, this the section in Acts in which Paul was put on trial for the same thing that he's praised for in the Christian community today. Okay. They came and approached him and they told him, hey, we heard that you're speaking against the law. Is there any truth to this? Paul had the opportunity to represent himself in a trial fashion in the book of Acts. Go and read it. I'll actually, matter of fact, I'll put that link of that video in his description as well. Um, and he says it with his own words. He doesn't speak against the law or the prophets. Okay. Now, now that I have that understanding, my mindset when I read Romans 7 and 6 is, well, what law is he talking about? Because clearly he can't be talking about the law of Moses because if he's talking against the law of Moses in Romans 7 and 1, then what was he doing in Acts, in the book of Acts, which was before? Paul can't be made a liar, right? Scripture can't be made to contradict itself. So this is what we mean. This is what uh, we talk about when we say you have to understand the Torah before you jump straight into the New Testament and start reading it and thinking you understand because there's a lot of things that you can't understand without knowing the Old Testament. <clears throat> All right, so with that said, let's get another witness. Let's get another witness. Let's go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter. And we're going to go to chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 15 through 17. <coughs> Excuse me. Verses 15 through 17, and it reads, And I count that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you as also in all his epistles speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction ye therefore beloved Seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. All right, from your own steadfastness. Now, this is Peter. This is Peter speaking, and he mentions Paul because he understands that Paul's writings are hard to understand. And he says it. He says Paul's writings are hard to understand. From those that are unlearned and unstable rest. Unlearned. If you don't know the Torah, if you're unlearned, you will not understand Paul fully. You will not. You, you can't because we'll get into that in, in a second. But you won't know him. And if Peter can identify that, then there's something to this, 
right? There's something here. There's something going on. So we're going to do some investigation. We're going to dig. We're going to figure out what is this law that we are delivered from in Romans 7 and 6. Because it's, 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 there's a contradiction right now. Right now there's a contradiction. The scriptures ain't lining up. And I don't like that. And I'm pretty sure you guys don't either. So let's get some clarification. All right. So let's go back to Romans. <coughs> Romans 7. And we'll go to verse 1. And it reads. Know ye not, brethren. For I speak to them that know the law. And how the law, and how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For I speak to them that know the law. Paul just said in his own words, he's speaking to those who know the law. You got to know the law to understand what he's saying. If you don't know the law, he's not speaking to you. I know when I was in Christianity and I asked one of the, the elders, he, I don't even know if he was an elder, but he was a really um, knowledgeable brother. He knew the scriptures in and out verbatim. He could spit them off, memorize them and everything. I asked him when I really was, when I really got serious into, you know, doing some studies in the scriptures and reading. And I asked him, I said, Hey, what is a good starting point? I'm trying to get to know. The most high, I'm trying to get to know the Messiah. I'm trying to get a knowledge of understanding of the scriptures. And he told me to go to John. Now, from a Christian perspective, John is a part of the Gospels. Getting to know the Messiah, I understand. I completely get it. I get it. Starting in John seemed like a logical choice. But once again, we have to take our Christian mindset and our lenses off and look at the scriptures objectively. OK, we cannot understand the New Testament without understanding the Old Testament. So guiding me to John first was a mistake and me going to John first was a mistake. And so I got a half misleading understanding of what the New Testament was talking about. And so therefore, later on, I had to go back to the Old Testament, read it, get a firm foundation and understanding and then reread the New Testament. New Testament to get a full understanding of the whole matter. All right. So we have went to Romans 7 and 6. We have read that we are delivered from the law. We also have read in Romans 7 and 1 that Paul said that. <coughs> <coughs> That we are, that I'm, uh, Paul said in Romans 7 and 1 that he is speaking to those that know the law. So let's continue with this investigation. Let's go to Romans 7 and 12. Romans 7 and 12 says, Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Okay, so pause for a second and I got to ask you a question. If the law is holy, the commandment holy, and just, and good. Now, does that sound like something that we need to be delivered from? Does it sound like something that we need to be freed from? It doesn't to me. What that does to me is it gives me more ammunition and an, and, and an encouragement to get back into these scriptures to try to figure out what Paul is talking about. Because something's not lining up here. He said we deliver from the law. But he's saying that it's good here. Even in verse 1, he says that the law have dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Meaning the law is continuously everlasting in our lives, ever present. So if it's something we deliver from, we need to figure out what's going on. So, let's go to verse 14. <clears throat> and it says, For we know that the law is spiritual, 
but I am carnal, sold under sin. He says that the law is spiritual. Many people who say that the law has been away with, that we are um, living in the new covenant under the Messiah, that we are now living by faith and under grace and not we live by faith, faith not by works. A lot of them think that the law of Moses was just this list, right? So I'm going to use my notebook as an example. They look at it like it's just a list of all of these, you know, all of these rules that we were told to follow. And that's it. This carnal, physical list that fades away because the Messiah brings the spirit into the aspect of salvation. You have to look into what he's saying, because in this verse, it says that the law is spiritual. The law is also spiritual. Just think back to the Ten Commandments, okay? The greatest of all commandments, love the most high. Love the most high with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. From your love for the most high, you demonstrate obedience by following the rest of the commandments. You follow the law from your love of the most high. That is spiritual. It's not solely physical it's not carnal it's spiritual as well <clears throat> so let's let's continue let's go to Romans 7 and 7 what shall we say then is the law sin the most high forbid nay I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Now, let me read from my notes here for that verse. And it says, Paul says, keeping the law is not sin. We would not know what sin was if we didn't have the law. So basically, Paul is saying that the law itself isn't sin. A, mis a misconception, people attribute the law and sin as one. The law isn't sin. The law just makes you aware of what sin is because it gives you instruction on how to conduct yourself. Okay? Paul says, I, I didn't know what lust was until the law said, thou shalt not covet. The law and sin are separate in regards. They're not the same. The law just identifies what sin is. And, and it's, so, it's to the point so much so that sin itself, the definition that's given to us in the Bible, has something to do with the law. So let's go to that really quick. Let's get it. Let's get it. Let's get a um a understanding. Let's go to First John chapter three. First John chapter three. We're gonna read verse four. First John chapter three, verse four. And it reads, "Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin." is the transgression of the law okay so i have another question i'm sorry i have to ask but i'm not sorry i'm not sorry but uh if sin we got the definition if sin is the transgression of the law if the law has been done away with and is no longer in effect then how can we sin if you take the law away, then you got to take sin away. But clearly, sin is still present. It's still evident. So, for those who believe that the law is done away with, I urge you to take a look into the world around you. Okay? The, the presence of sin proves the presence of the law. Because sin is a transgression of the law. You have to have the law 
present if you're gonna have sin, okay? Because the law identifies what sin is. <clears throat> and I mean, I don't know, I can't stress that enough, but we'll continue because there are still people who, and, and I understand, I was in Christianity for 10 years in the ministry. Right, giving my all, reading the scriptures, trying to get understanding, helping people, praying for people, all these other things. So when I felt like my faith, my belief system was being questioned, I did feel some kind of way. Okay, and I understand how some some Christians who may be watching this video may feel. I get it. I understand. I was where you were. I was where you are now. Okay, and I know you need more. To let everything fully come together. And that's what this lesson is here for. Not just for Christians. I don't want to try to, you know, single anybody out. Anybody who wants to get an understanding of the scriptures. Because that's what it is. That's what it's here for. We go through trials, tribulations, and situations that's difficult. So that we get that knowledge and that understanding and experience. So we can share it to somebody else so they don't have to go through it. Alright? So let's continue with this lesson. Right, let's go to Romans 7. Again, we back in seven. And we're going to go to verse eight and nine. And it reads, But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. I hate that word. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Now, I'm going to read my note here because sometimes I write things in a better way than I can explain it off the top of my head. So, I wrote, we are alive doing whatever we want it to, but died when the commandment came, okay, you 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 out there, you living you living your life, you doing what you want to do, you partying, you fornicating, whatever the case may be, you live you living a life. When you when you seek the scriptures, and Torah hits you, you're made aware of all of your wrongdoing, right? So there's a sense of guilt, there's a sense of conviction, and that sin revives, like the scripture says. And then against the Torah, you die, right? You're dead. And there is more scripture to help um, bring this, this, this picture together really quick. In Romans 6, Romans 6, chapter, um, uh, verse 23, 23. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of a higher or the most high or Elohim is eternal life through the Messiah. The wages of sin is death. And I know you guys, I know you guys have heard that before. And it ties all together. Once again, keep in mind, Paul said that he's speaking to those who know the law. All right. Now, I wrote here, and this is another good point to make. So, the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die for, for our sins. And our reward from the Most High is eternal life through Christ, if we're righteous. This is for those who are faithful. We are not going to be rewarded for living sinfully, living in contrary to the Most High's word, living in contrary to the law. It's not a reward that's going to happen to us. So that's my, like my biggest um, issue with a lot of, um, a lot of Christian doctrine is there's this, this um, I don't know, this, this idea that you can live your life sinfully, say you're sorry, receive salvation and be rewarded for living contrary 
there's forgiveness, don't get me wrong, but forgiveness only comes through repentance. Repent means to turn away from. It doesn't mean to say you're sorry. So if you sin, if you committed a sin and you repented, that means you never did that sin again. But there's this, there's this, there's this idea that since we have grace, that we can sin and sin and sin and sin and sin and just say we're sorry and continue living our life and doing everything we want to do, and it's okay. That's not the case. Because if that was the truth and that the law was done away with, then there's no accountability. There's nothing holding us to act right, to be responsible, to follow the most high. There's nothing in place if the law is not there. So we have to understand what grace is. Grace is the opportunity to be forgiven. Because the Most High doesn't play. In the Old Testament, he was killing folks with no problems. Instantly. Oh, you go against his word? Oh, you dead. He opened up, opened up the ground, swallowed people up, killed people on the spot, hurled fire down, all types of stuff. If the Most High told the people of Israel that only the Levites could touch the Ark of the Covenant, and on the road to taking the Ark of the Covenant from point A to point B, one of the Levites that was holding the Ark stumbled and a guard touched the Ark, trying to hold it up because he didn't want the Ark to fall. And the Most High killed him on the spot because the Most High said, don't touch my Ark of the Covenant unless you're a Levite. If he was that serious about that, what makes you he what makes what makes you think that all of a sudden in his New Testament he became became this nice forgiving pansy type of God? He ain't the scripture says he changes not. He's the same yesterday, he's the same today, he's the same tomorrow. If he was that serious back in the old testament, what makes you think he ain't playing in his New Testament? We be taking grace we be taking grace for granted. Grace ain't going to save you. Grace gives you the opportunity to not be killed immediately for the sin that you're doing. It gives you the opportunity to repent. But if you live in an unrepentant life, lifestyle, you need to get right with the most high because destruction is coming your way. And I'm just saying that with love as a brother. You got to get it together. All right. So um, let's go ahead and move on. We go to chapter, uh, chapter seven again. We're going to go to verse 8. Okay. <clears throat> I know we was there earlier, but maybe this hits a little bit differently. Reading it now. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, brought in me all manner of concubiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. Then I wrote, maybe after this it makes more sense. It's not the law that brings sin. Without the law, sin was dead. Was dead. Once you know the law, sin tries to creep in and hold you accountable against the law. So the law, that uh, the burden that's mentioned is the burden of the law holding you accountable. It's not mentioning like the burden is too heavy for you to carry. We know that the scripture says my burden is light and my yoke is easy. So I don't understand why. The law is being misconstrued as something that's just this insurmountable object that cannot be upheld. Because you can follow the law. You can follow the law. Let's go to uh, 12 and 13. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me. Most high forbid. But sin that it might appear sin worketh death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. It isn't the law that kills you, but sin that brings death. The law is good. The law is good. Let's continue. Ain't really much to say about that if you ain't get it. I mean... 
I don't know how I'm, I don't know how to break it down more than that. You know, I be gonna go fifteen to sixteen. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto law that is good. All right, so I know there was a lot of wordplay there. His, his, word is, <laughs> his words are hard to be understood for sure. All right, let's break it down. Okay. Paul is saying what he wants to do, he fails. And that which he doesn't want to do, he succeeds at. That sinful flesh, but once he recognizes that what he does is bad, he is in agreement with the law that said it was bad. Therefore, the law is good. So... Do you ever find yourself in a situation where you want to do good, right? You want to do good. You want to serve the most high. You want to follow scripture. You want to live according to what he says. But you keep finding yourself sinning, right? In your mind, you don't want to sin. You don't want to sin. You want to do what's right, but you don't do what's right. And you don't want to sin, but you end up sinning. So you're doing what you hate. You're doing what you don't want to do. And you're not doing what you want to do. This is what Paul is talking about. Paul is placing himself in our shoes. Our everyday struggle, Paul is, is exhibiting the same demonstration of behavior that we have been dealing with. Okay? Let's continue. Now, it's about to start getting good. I mean, it's always good. The most high's word is always good. But I'm talking about in regards to this investigation that we're doing. Let's go to verse 20 and 21. And it reads, Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Alright, so Paul is basically reiterating what he just said in the other verses that we just read but he's digging a little bit deeper because he's identifying the, 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 the issue he's identifying the problem he's saying that he says if I do that I would not it's not me that do it but the sin is within me okay so he's saying that the sin is doing it not him it's the sin that's within him that's causing him to transgress the law okay in verse 21 it says i find in a law that when i do good evil is present with me okay now this is the first indication outside of what i what i see when i read verse six this is the first indication that something else is going on here okay because he says he finds a law so what is this law that he's talking about so there's a connection between verse 20 and 21, I mean, in verse 6. He mentions we're delivered from a law in verse 6. He's talking about a law in verse 21. Out. Let's continue to verse 22. In verse 22, reads, For I delight in the law of the Most High after the inward man. Now, for some of you guys, this just closed the deal for you. He says he delights in in the law of the most high after the inward man does that sound like something that needs to be delivered from does that sound like something that brings death does that sound like something that brings sin does that sound like something that is sin does that sound like something that should be done away with no but for those who are still on this ride and they're holding on to their conviction come on let's go we're gonna, we're gonna crush this right now verse 23 let's bring it on home but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to 
the law of sin, which is in my members. So remember, we said in 20, now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. The law of sin, which is in his members, that dwelleth within him. The law of sin is what he's mentioning in verse 6. The law of sin. It's sin. It's sin. It's not the, the law of the Most High. It's not the Torah. It's not the, the law of Moses. It's not the Old Testament that he's doing away with. He's saying we're delivered from sin. We're delivered from sin. <coughs> All right. Let's break it down. Let's break it down. It's a couple examples. I got. I had to write these down. Let's break it down. All right. So <coughs> there's another law fighting against the most high's law, the law of sin that dwells within our flesh. <coughs> so when you are tempted, for example, to have sex with another man's wife, the law of the most high is saying no. But the law of sin within you is fighting the law of the most high, telling you it's okay. We are held captive, right, by our desires of the law of sin. Okay, we're held captive. As an example of um, the law of sin and the law of the most high conflicting, here's an ex another example. Have you ever tried to make excuses for yourself to sin? It's like your subconscious was justifying the act to make it seem okay for you to do it that is a time where the law of sin is fighting with the law of the most high i look at it like <coughs> that good old uh devil on one shoulder angel on the other shoulder whispering whispering in your ear which way you gonna go are you gonna go with the negative side that makes it sound good or are you gonna go with the good side that makes it seem uh, dull and uninteresting so that's a prime example. You have another law at work here. We've identified the law. Now, just just for uh, clarification, conclusion, let's bring it all home, okay? Let's reread verse 6. But substitute the word sin for its definition, okay? And we'll substitute the law that is mentioning here in verse 6 for the actual for actually what it is which is the law of sin so if we're reading it with the understanding that we just got it reads but now we are delivered from the law of sin okay that being dead wherein we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Now that was substituting the law for the law of sin. Now let's get an even thorough reread of this verse with a deeper meaning and understanding. But now we are delivered from the law of sin, which is transgressing the law so we're delivered from the transgression of the law okay we're delivered from that we're delivered from the transgression the law of sin that being dead wherein we were held pause right there let's go let's go to Verse, what did it say that at? Right, twenty three. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law in my mind, and bringing me into captivity, okay, 
that's another hint, another key indicator that these two verses are linked. For those who still have an issue with us bouncing around Romans, keep in mind, go back to Isaiah 28. You have to read a little here, a little there to get full understanding of what's going on. 23 says it's brings it, bring, bringing him into captivity. <clears throat> Verse 6 is saying you're held. You're held captive, okay? When you fall into the law of sin, <clears throat> when you allow the law of sin to defeat you, you're now a slave to sin. And the wages of sin is death. <clears throat> That's why it's important that you follow the law of the Most High. Paul wasn't talking about the law being done away with. <clears throat> Paul was trying to save you. Paul was trying to put himself in your shoes. Explain what he was going through. Because he knows that you're going to go through it. And he put it in a way that could break everything down and give you understanding and encouragement to follow the law even more so. Paul wasn't speaking against the law. He knows about sin. He knows about temptation. He knows about that, that battle with between the law the most high and the law of sin. He knows because he dealt with it. He says it, <coughs> which is why he put himself in these verses. He said that I, 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 he spoke from a first person perspective trying to save you and that brings me to the lesson that came to mind after getting an understanding of Romans chapter 7 how many people are dealing with sin and they just feel like they can't get out of it well it outlined it here you're being held captive you're a slave to sin right now you are a slave. You are in captivity. Hey, man, what's up? I got, I got 3,000 energy. <laughs> I, I could run all day. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, well, you just woke up, so we'll get you some breakfast in a minute. I'm doing a video right now, so I'll get you in a minute. Go ahead. Uh, uh, let me finish this video. All right. I'll be out there in a second. Okay. What's the, what's the video games? Video games are in here, but I'll be out there in a minute. Okay. All right. Close the door. So, if you're dealing with sin, if you're dealing with that overwhelming feeling like you just don't know what to do, you feel like you can't get out. You feel like you're drowning. It's understandable. The scriptures already talked about it. The scriptures already said that when you when you deal with when you deal with sin, you you're bringing death unto your life. You're being held captive, and you're pretty much put in bondage. You're a slave. You're in shackles to sin. Okay. But you have to follow the law. Of the most high and you have to also have faith not only in him but in his son to be able to overcome that because the messiah came and he laid out the blueprint he laid out the blueprint for salvation and if you listen to his words he was the living embodiment of the law itself it's like if the law just took on physical form and came to earth to teach itself. That was the Messiah. He taught the disciples. He taught Paul. He taught the apostles. He laid the foundation for salvation by using the law. When he taught physically, he spoke from Torah. Okay? His disciples followed Torah. A little known fact about Paul that a lot of people don't know is he followed the Torah. He was a Nazarite. 
And if you don't know what a Nazarite is, go into the Old Testament. It's, it, it speaks about it. It talks about a Nazarite. A Nazarite is an individual who is living according to the Most High in a higher standard than the average man. They don't drink. They don't cut their hair. There's a couple of other things that goes on that normal people could indulge in, right? And there's also a way to end your Nazarite vow by specific cleansing uh, action that you got to do. And that's outlined in Torah. And Paul says it in the New Testament that he had to go through that. So if the law was done away with, or if Paul was speaking against the law, why would he follow the law breakdown of how to end your Nazarite vow? If he wasn't following it, it doesn't make sense. All of these little clues and stuff that's left in the, in the New Testament should lead you to understand that the Old Testament was fully in effect during this time. And if it was in effect during this time, it's in effect during our time. Okay, so I end with this. Get into the scriptures. Get into the law. Get into the Old Testament. Um, follow what the Most High gave us as an instruction. Um, the Bible, so this is how I look at it. Basic instruction before leaving earth. Simple. Everything you need is right in here. Okay, you have the Most High Himself, you have His prophets, you have kings, you have the Messiah, you have apostles, you have um, disciples, you even have evil people, and learn from their mistakes. All of those things will lead you to the Most High. So, the law is not done away with it. Paul did not speak against the law. And surprisingly, from all of this, from this lesson, realize that if you're being held captive, there's a way out. If you're being held captive by sin, then you can find a way to be broken free. And it's through the Torah. It's through the law. It's through the Messiah. Because nobody comes to the Father but through him. Okay? You guys be blessed. I hope that you got, got edif edification from this or at least some information that you can use or pass along. Okay. Um, so, that being said, shalom.